All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to uh, the New Brunswick Heart Center uh, Cardiovascular Rounds. Um, I, first of all, I would like to uh, thank everyone yet again for joining. Um, our participation continues to climb week in and week out, which is, which is fantastic. Uh, uh, Dr. White and I are especially pleased with how these rounds have gone. We've got another couple of weeks ahead of us. Uh, on the 17th of June, we have Dr. Craig Brown giving part two of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then last but not least, on the 24th of June, Dr. Chris White will be giving a short primer on cardiogenic shock. And uh, we, all, we all actually uh, partook in a case last night that would be a perfect sort of case model for how you know, shock can be managed and can be really managed quite well here at the Heart Center. So that will kind of close off this academic year. And then of course, so we'll start up again in September with a whole new slew of talks and uh, look forward to having other people's inputs uh, as to you know, topics of interest, et cetera. I'd also like to uh, extend a welcome, uh, not only to uh, our new nursing hires, uh, welcome, uh, obviously, and then obviously, um, we, are, we are excited to have you on board, uh, not only on this Zoom session, but also just in general uh, at the Heart Center. Uh, we hope your time here is, 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 is fruitful and, and successful um, and, and hopefully long too. Uh, and then last but not least, I'd like to welcome all the cardiologists from across the province uh, who are joining in from uh, Moncton, from Fredericton, from Miramichi, from Bathurst, and now uh, Prince Edward Island. And uh, we're excited to be extending this platform out to uh, all of our referring physicians uh, who uh, contribute uh, so much to making our practice, the practice successful here. So it is, it is my honor to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Rakesh Arora from uh, the University of Manitoba. Uh, Rakesh is, uh, is, is currently the professor and head of cardiac surgery and cardiac critical care uh, at the St. Boniface Hospital and University of Manitoba in Winnipeg. Um, he is truly a leader in, in cardiac critical care. Um, what's, what's really exciting is that Rakesh, JF, and I, we all train together uh, at the same time. And, and you know, we're, we're obviously great friends before we've now turned into professional colleagues. Um, and Rakesh is the, uh, is the next incoming president of the Cardi uh, Canadian Society of Cardiac Surgeons, but has really taken the lead on uh, cardiac surgical critical care. I can honestly say that before Rakesh became the first uh, fellow in the area of uh, cardiac surgery critical care, the field never really existed. It was, uh, it was people uh, who were uh, dibbling and dabbling in, in cardiac surgical critical care, but never with formal training. And he's turned it into not only a, a science, but an art form. And, uh, and I think it's very exciting. Um, he not only co-founded the Canadian Cardiovascular Critical Care Society, he is now actively involved uh, internationally on this front and has really pushed the agenda forward. So uh, with that in mind, I thought it would be very cool uh, to have him come uh, and give a talk about uh, CALS, which is Cardiac Surgery Advanced Life Support, uh, and, and, and speak to the subject of resuscitation after cardiac surgery and how the rules have changed. And as I said in my email, there's been a paradigm shift. It's not just, uh, well, you know, you're having an arrest, you're an ACLS patient. There's a whole different mechanism to resuscitating these patients uh, in our ICU um, and, and elsewhere post-cardiac surgery. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Aurora and, and thank him profusely for having uh, taken the time out of his schedule and uh, having joined in uh, really super early to make this possible. Thank you. Great. Th thanks very much, Answer, for that very generous introduction. Hopefully, is my audio still okay? You can hear me? Yeah. Grant. Okay. So as Answer mentioned, we've known each other for a long time, uh, probably over 20 years now, uh, from starting residency in cardiac surgery at Dalhousie. Uh, you can see JF uh, here on the uh, left side of your screen from us taking off somewhere for a meeting early in the morning with the appropriate beverage you can see in JF's hand. And Anstar has always been the, uh, I won't say the class clown is probably not the right term, but always the uh, resident comedian. Uh, even from years past when we were residents, we, uh, JF and I and Anstar would produce the annual Christmas show where we had a great deal of fun uh, entertaining the troops as part of uh, our annual event. Um, so thank you very much, both of you, for the invitation, and it's a pleasure to meet, e meet you online for the rest of your team. I will also like to try to acknowledge my surgical team and ICU team. It's really an honor to work with a group of people who are generally interested in doing the right thing by our patients every single day, which makes my job 
a lot easier. And implementing things such as we're going to talk about today, which is a paradigm shift, as Ansar has mentioned, it really requires a team to engage in this process and want to be part of that change, which can be often difficult, particularly in some things that have been quite dogmatically drilled into us from out of the womb of how we're supposed to do arrest protocols in a hospitalized patient. Uh, the third acknowledgement is Mr. Joel Dunning, who is a cardiothoracic surgeon in Middlesbrough in, U in the UK. Um, this whole process started with his observation as a registrar uh, in his, during his training where he went to his first arrest and found that the current processes for the cardiothoracic patient and cardiac patient for us on the line today really wasn't adequate and there had to be a better way. So he undertook a very elaborate process to redesign uh, not only how we look at cardiac arrest, but then how we actually teach it, which is equally important, often a very important element that's forgotten within any guideline development. Um, I have these particular disclosures, which have no direct relevance to this talk, other than a third one down is I have been on the advisory board for the North American Implementation of Cardiac Surgery Unit Advanced Life Support, or CSU ALS, which is a terrible acronym. Uh, we have called it CALS everywhere else in the world, but it was a trademark issue in the North America, so we had to come up with this uh, ridiculous acronym. I will also say that what I'm going to present for you the next sort of 15 minutes is really a full day course. So I understand this is a very much an abbreviated uh, presentation, but I'm very happy to entertain any questions, obviously, and expand where needed. So for the next 15 minutes, I'll go through sort of four basic components. I'll give you a brief example of a, of a patient who had an issue postoperatively um, to frame this conversation why this is important for your team. It's not just thinking about cardiac arrest, but really in the broader theme of quality and safety, specifically how the rules have changed and why they've changed for us in cardiac surgery and how our patients are different perhaps than someone that rests on an internal medicine floor. And then what's your team supposed to do to get started uh, will be the next phase. I'd always like to put the spoilers up front in case you get called away to the operating room or to the ICU or just too busy playing Candy Crush, that there's really what we're, this talk is about is providing appropriate care for patients that can exist 24 hours a day. So the processes that we're going to talk about today really can be done by a team regardless of who your team complement is, i.e. if you have a surgeon in-house or not, and really a patient who arrests at 3 o'clock in the morning should be held to the same level and of help that can be done at 9 o'clock in the morning. Secondly, I think we have to admit that there is a problem. While we tend to all say we don't have this problem in our patients, it occurs. <clears throat> Probably at the rate of about 4 to 5% in certain jurisdictions in the United States and in Canada. That we have to admit there is a problem of under-recognition when a patient's getting in trouble, such to the point where they have hypotensive, hypotensive emergencies, or worse, a cardiac arrest. And that restoronomy for a patient is really part of a multi-step process. So again, I'm going to focus on the chest opening component to some degree for this talk. But understand there's a process that your team has to get your head dropped around and how to head this off much earlier upstream and develop a process of appropriate team communication to avoid cardiac arrest in the first place. So it's really around situational awareness and team training when you're thinking about implementing new protocols of any sort, but specifically for the cardiac surgery unit advanced life support components. Why is this important? Well, external CPR is ineffective in the two most common causes that cause arrest in our patients, that being extreme hypovolemia, such as bleeding, or cardiac tamponade. It's probably even effective when you have attention to a thorax, but that's perhaps a separate issue. Regardless of the scenario, ineffective CPR, where you cannot maintain a main arterial uh, pressure of at least 60 millimeters of mercury to the brain, will result in irreversible brain damage within five minutes. And many patients will only be saved by a rapid re emergency re-sternotomy. Okay, so let's start with a little bit of theme one in terms of a frame. I have a, a 46-year-old patient that was in our unit, had a recent non-STEMI, uh, was put, given a, a full load of uh, antiplatelet agents and remained on um, a dual antiplatelet therapy. We were planning to wait for a uh, five-day standoff after letting the Plavix wear off. Unfortunately, the first day of stopping her Plavix, she started having chest pain and had to go urgently into the operating room. She has multi-vessel disease and had an urgent in-hospital in CAB 3-4 uh, while pretty much being fully anticoagulated. She comes out, puts out a fair bit of blood in the first hour, about uh, 100, 500 cc's, but in, as the usual thing as we're being very aggressive and treating with blood products and platelets, uh, it, the bleeding stops very rapidly. Uh, we have an increasing vasopressor requirements. The CVP is still only eight, however, and we're arranging for a bedside echo echocardiogram to come over and take a look to see if we have any issues. In the midst of all this, this happens. 
I'm going to let that play just in case there's a bit of a delay, but you can see the rhythms obviously changed and all the lines are now going very flat, which is a problem. And so at this point in time, you can probably say in this situation, we're not winning and a problems happen where certain stuff has hit the fan. So going into the second theme of this talk then is really around team quality and safety. I don't think there's necessarily a quality issue so far in this case, but now this is where the quality part kicks in is how we're gonna rescue this patient. And again, it's about having everyone doing their, pro their team process in a correct fashion to get a, a good result in a day without jeopardizing the safety of either the patient or yourself as part of the process. So what we're talking about here is a metric that is becoming increasingly common within cardiac surgery is this concept of failure to rescue, which is defined as a clinical scenario in which mortality results from a potentially modifiable complication. And so this is becoming an important metric for us to consider. And why? When you look at the reasons for why people die after cardiac surgery, there's a process that's been developed by the Michigan uh, Society of Thora uh, uh, Cardiovascular and Thoracic Surgeons, a quality improvement initiative, where they defined um, how people die in various phases of care or POCMA, phase of care mortality analysis. And while we think a lot of deaths occur interoperatively, that's only about one in five patients. The vast majority of patients suffer a significant insult leading to their death outside of the OR about 80% of the time, of which of anywhere from a quarter to one third occurs in the ICU, cardiac arrest being one of those examples. And the top two categories for why this occur are either catastrophes, such as the example that I've shown for you today, where there has been an un, uh, unanticipated cardiac arrest, or other deficiencies in treatments that leads to acute de uh, decompensation. Importantly, both in Ontario and as well as in the United States, they found that patients who are at the highest risk for preventable death are those patients you would anticipate to be in the lowest risk category. So while obviously a patient that comes in who's on multiple anitropes, impressors, and or an ECMO or one you think that would die, it's actually the patients who have the routine cabbage, as we've seen in this particular example, that the highest rates of preventable death. So again, there's a long history about how cardiac arrest support started all the way back to the 1500s, which is a fascinating read in and of itself. But I really focus today, again, just on the one element that's important for us is why we're different in the cardiac surgery unit versus those people have arrest either out of hospital or even in hospital. And this picture really tells the whole story here in many ways. While a patient at home may have a witnessed or unwitnessed cardiac arrest with really no support around them, those patients in ICU are very heavily monitored. They have highly skilled people such as yourselves at the bedside. And we often know when the arrest has happened right away. And particularly for the cardiac surgery patient, we're often quite aware of what the cause is in many cases. And we have the ability to get back into the sternum again relatively rapidly with appropriate team training. So this process that Mr. Dunning started was back in the mid 2000s where he did an international survey, approached the European um, uh, uh, resuscitation councils and developed a European guideline that was published in 2009. This was then brought to North America through the Society of uh, Thoracic Surgery to update these guidelines um, as part of a, a task force I had the privilege to be part of. We started this in 2014, we redid a writ literature review and took the previous uh, European guidelines and updated them using a Delphi-like process to achieve consensus to ensure that it was modernized and contextualized in a North American context. From there, this is the basic protocol. Again, if you remember nothing else from this talk, this is a, a picture you should have in your unit once your team is appropriately trained. Being cardiac surgeons, we're, we're not typically capable of counting more than four. There's four chambers, four valves, three vessels. So we try to use the same basic process for the three basic pathways that can occur after cardiac surgery that leads to cardiac arrest. Either the heart rate's too fast, too slow, or ineffective. So in other words, you have ventricular fibrillation or tachycardia, severe asystole or bradycardia, uh, or electrical pulseless activity are the two things. And where there is the process of starting basic life support, I'm gonna show you now some key differences that occur in our patients versus standard ACLS as we go through this protocol. Again, this can be a, a two hour talk in itself, but I'm gonna really focus on one example just to kind of start the conversation. So to highlight what's different, there's five key things that are different from standard ACLS. Firstly, stop doing CPR right away. Wait to do CPR, and I'll explain why in just a moment. For, for the example I'm gonna give you for VTVF, you're gonna give three stack shocks rather than cycle of shock drug CPR. 
I'm going to ask you, your teams to stop all drugs that are infusing. And this is often a very difficult concept to get around, but again, I'll explain why. Not to use epinephrine except to buy contr in controlled circumstances by experienced uh, personnel and get ready to open the chest. Again, what we, the advantage we have in our situation is that we can reestablish blood supply to the brain by more effective internal CPR versus external CPR. Or in fact, if you just open the sternum and relieve the tamponade, maybe treatment of itself uh, in those cases. Again, I'm gonna focus on two of these key elements here, why three stack shocks and why no epinephrine. But again, I can talk about these other ones as we go through uh, the question period there afterwards. So let's focus on one element of this protocol of ventricular fibrillation. What we're asking teams to do, it's a standoff doing CPR because there are several case reports in the case series where doing CPR in a post-operative patient's led to significant injury to either the RV or grafts or dehissing a valve. Um, and if you can get shock therapy to a patient rapidly, i.e. within one to two minutes, and provide three shocks at maximum joules, it actually will provide hopefully a better chance of uh, return of spontaneous circulation um, without doing CPR. The reason being, particularly in the post-op cardiac surgery patient whose pericardium has been invaded, the normal physiology is quite different. And the chance of success of getting a, a, now a dilated heart back to a rhythm really diminishes markedly after the first two minutes. You can see this very crude figure here, which is quite effective nonetheless. After the first two minutes, your chance of success goes down almost logarithmically to 80%, 60%. And once you get beyond five minutes, you're probably much less than 50% or even 20% of having any chance of success. Do so you think of how often you've done CPR in your post-operative patients without establishing a spontaneous circulating rhythm, often 10 minutes or longer, your chance of success is often quite low, if not zero. The second major thing is we often give is a big dose of epinephrine. And again, this has been standard part of ACLS therapy since the 60s when the first guidelines came out to the American Heart Association. But if you actually look at where this science comes from, it's actually not really steeped in a great deal of randomized trials. So this really started over a century ago in the late 1800s where Gottlieb took some uh, adrenal glands from, from rabbits and thought, well, this is a good idea, let's try it in humans. So they tried this in dogs in the early 1900s and they gave this infusion of, of epinephrine that greatly had more dogs get up and walk away than, than those that didn't in the setting of both um, hypovolemia and anesthetic um, uh, asphyxia. And that's where this dose of one in 1000 concentration came from. So that's 100 years ago. And there has been really no real science on epinephrine until very recently, which came out a couple of years ago now with a paramedic two trial where they really looked at epinephrine versus saline and looking at 30 day outcomes and found in general, while most people may be alive with the use of epinephrine and cardiac arrest, particularly out of hospital cardiac arrest, that the, the they had more neurologic uh, difficulties. So there really was no benefit. So after using this agent for over hundred years, now a trial has finally been done showing that the dose that we've been using for epinephrine really does not provide any significant benefit for cardiac arrest. Specifically for our patients, if you look at what the anesthesiologist give in the operating theater, they're really micro aliquots uh, like, uh, of what we would give, which is a full milligram dose in, in a cardiac arrest situation. And particularly for our patients, when you do relieve the tamponade, you can have significant overshoot of blood pressure leading to significant complications of bleeding. And worst case scenario is uh, aortic or cannulation site blowout, which can then be a catastrophic situation that may be irrecoverable there afterwards. Okay, so how do you get started and how, what's your team supposed to do? So there are, much like a, a taking technology from uh, racing car pit crews, the, the key concept here is there has to be a defined number of people to facilitate rapid reopening with dedicated roles. And so there are six key roles plus others, we'll say in this particular case, where you were meant to organize yourself around the bed and do and have a particular job. Each person can take on a particular role and the team leader will help guide them down whichever pathway of those three pathways that you're on. Again, this is hard to explain in a picture such as this, but basically you have the five people or six people. Person one is the person who will stand off and do CPR only when required. Person two will manage the airway. Person three will be the person I define as the electrician who will hook up the pacing pads or defibrillating pads. Patient four will be the team leader. Patient five will be able to be the bedside nurse who will be the drug administrator who will turn off all their, uh, their syringe drivers um, because whatever you've been giving that patient at that point in time has not worked and the patient's arrested or worse, whatever drug you've given may have led to the arrest if there's been a drug error. So that's the reason why we ask the teams to run off, turn off all their, their infusions, 
but the bedside nurse likely knows which is their open line as a driver in case you need to give a drug, in sex, for example, amiodarone or other drugs in setting with cardiac arrest. And the sixth person is the gopher or the usually the most senior nurse you have on your team who would help coordinate calling for the team, calling for the blood products, and getting the sternotomy cart, which I'll show for you in just a moment in a video. You'll likely need other team members as well to start prepping and draping to open the sternum and doing this in expedition fa expeditious fashion. When someone arrests, the goal again are to get the chest open in less than six minutes, ideally less than four minutes, again, to prevent irreversible brain injury. So again, this is probably best shown by a video. So we'll go to that video next, answer if you don't mind. I think trying to do it over Zoom, the frame rate is not great. So answer is, uh, is gonna show you the video in real time there. It's a bit long, so I might just cut it a bit short uh, just for the purposes of trying to get through this in a timely fashion. Answer? I need some help in here. Delivering shock or clear? Charging deep in. Delivering shock or clear? Charging deep in. Delivering shock or clear? Three okay. shots delivered. Okay, guys, we're still in there. Okay, so Chris, can you start seeing? Yeah, Chris, can you um, bag the patient, please? And guys, start getting all the guys. Answer. Maybe just in the interest of time, I can I can stop it there, and then we can insert the full video uh, in the final presentation that you upload to uh, there afterwards. Okay, thanks very much, Answer. Um, so that's, I, I, we'll, we'll cut this video just a little bit short there in the interest of time, uh, but I will um, uh, happily share that whole video uh, with you there afterwards uh, uh, that you can watch in, in total in, in your own time. So I think what we'll do is just quickly move on to get this, to, to go through some in, in a reasonable period of time. The, again, this whole talk can take multiple hours to do this in, in, uh, in its entirety, but you get the sense of what was required to move the team along quickly and have a coordinated sort of series of events to be able to get in the sternum quickly. One key point that I'll, I'll point out that would may not have been obvious from that particular video is that your standard sternotomy cart will likely not be helpful in the ICU. So we're suggesting using a reduced sternotomy cart with only the bare essentials with a retractor, a scalpel, something to remove the wires, and then a suction tubing to evacuate uh, the mediastinum as needed. Okay, so to wrap things up then, what, going back to our case in terms of how this actually works in real time, so this particular patient had a PA arrest at roughly five o'clock, sort of just after our shift change. So we're with our evening crew with a reduced staff after hours. We had a, uh, the, ch the chest was draped. You can see we give a minute dose of epinephrine just to maintain some mean coronary perfusion pressure. We had the sternum open within, within two minutes and ROSC was uh, achieved within four minutes uh, there afterwards. So the total downtime was less than four minutes. The patient was taken to the OR for bleeding. The patient came back to me that night when I was on call 
and I extubated the patient about an hour after returning from the operating theater. And then we had some discharge issues due to social problems, but eventually we should have been discharged on day five, but went home on day nine. This uh, figure is shown for you really to show that uh, this can occur in any kind of context. So we're, we're a very um, MD heavy model where we have intensivists 24 hours a day. This is from a group uh, from California, from Jill Lay's group, that's a nurse only run ICU. So there's no in-house staff um, uh, other than the bedside RNs. And you can see that with the implementation of the CALS protocol in their particular ICU with nurse run chest opening and team trained asso associately appropriately so that their overall failure to rescue rate had markedly diminished there afterwards. So they were able to successfully resuscitate patients who had arrest after cardiac surgery. Okay, to wrap things up, I think there's probably five key points to take home today. I think first we have to admit that cardiac arrest does happen and we have to admit there's a problem and it can lead to high rates of failure to rescue in your patients. Restonotomy is part of a multi-step process. So while again, I'm focused on the chest opening component of this, it's really a team awareness, situational awareness process that your team has to get around that involves team training. And patients will often only be saved with rapid emergency stenotomy in, in a lot of our cases that leads to arrest post-operatively. So having this part of your armamentarium to do smoothly and effectively will be key to improving your failure to rescue rates. So with there again, always remember safety first, and uh, again, I'll stop there and happy to take any questions. Thanks very much. Thank you, Rakesh, that was excellent. Uh, maybe I'll just get you to go back to your slide, uh, well, <laughs> uh, to where you just kind of, your over, your, just your overview of CALS, where you started with yep. the and then you. And I think we should sure. kind of have that. Oh, well, there you go. Exactly. There we go. Perfect. Um, and then, so uh, from our standpoint, I mean, obviously uh, this is something on, um, you know, this is something that, you know, every, every, every cardiac surgical unit needs to really focus on. And I think, you know, each time it, it, it is a learning process. And I think for our ICU, it's especially important, but a lot of our patients do go to other centers and, and, and we get admitted to their CCUs, et cetera. And it is, it, you know, not to say that it is a common occurrence, but it can happen. So I think this is valuable for everyone. Uh, not just simply people here at the regional. Um, from, from your standpoint, if our center was interested in getting our nurses trained on this, now obviously the pandemic has had an impact on you know the ability to train. Right. Uh, what what would you suggest uh, we should we should do? So there is a formal and informal process. So again, I'll have to acknowledge my disclosure as being part of the advisory board for the CSU ALS North American Group because it's a separate now entity um, that helps teams train. Um, but I guess first starting with the familiarity of the protocol, which again, you can see it's very simple and um, having a, you need to have a team leader. I think you need to have both an MD and an RN dyad lead on this to develop processes and then analyze your own situation of how you would think you would implement this in your particular site. That's probably step one. Step two then is probably simplifying your research and autonomy cart. Uh, and really identifying which patients would be appropriate for CALS and which ones that wouldn't. So for example, if you're doing a minimally invasive uh, approach, that may not be the best patients to start with. Um, the third thing then is to actually have your teams formally trained, which can be quite a large endeavor. And so when you have rare events, it requires ongoing sort of baseline level of training of your team, then ongoing simulation on a regular basis to ensure that you have all these steps in place. We, this is an area that we fall short on that I, I have to admit that with nursing turnover that we have in our unit, as well as infrequency of training, that it's sometimes like reinventing the wheel with a new team each time we have to run this. So even a center that's you know meant to be a center of excellence of, of CALS, that ongoing training and discussion around this is really key. So whether it's monthly or bi-monthly of having simulations are important. The mannequin that you saw in the video is available for purchase. You can probably develop your own as well, but that particular one has the ability to go through a sternum with different sternal plates. We can practice cutting the wires and doing internal massage. Excellent. Chris? I, I see. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Right, go ahead. Yeah, hey, morning, Rakesh. Thanks for, for another excellent talk as always. Um, I just, uh, you know, wondered if, um, there is a official and unofficial uh, suggestion in terms of duration post chest closure that you feel the chest opening is, is still a right. safe and valuable procedure. I guess question one and question right. two is, uh, should an arrest happen on the ward as opposed to the ICU, uh, what your local protocol is for dealing with those patients? 
Yeah, so two great questions, Chris, thank you. So question one about the duration. So in the guidelines that we put through, we said somewhere between seven to 10 days, depending on your patient, for two reasons. One, once you get up beyond that time point, the, um, the ability to get into the sternum rapidly with, an, with a team that may not involve the surgeon is probably a little bit more tricky. And two, the reasons why people arrest at that point are often very different than what happens in the first 24 to 48 hours. And therefore the utility of chest opening may not be as much benefit as in the early stage. With regards to a patient where this should occur, so we have been primarily doing this in the cardiac surgery ICU. We do have, unfortunately, uh, though it, uh, we all say it never happens, it does happen on the post-operative ward within the first seven days uh, while they're down there. And we have done both cardiac arrest on the ward or done a scoop and run sort of process where we bring them back to the ICU uh, with ongoing CPR. And I think it really depends on who your team is and how well your team's trained to do this and what your physical infrastructure would be like on the ward. So in the guidelines, we don't specifically provide a recommendation, but rather to contextualize it to your own center. I will say for our center, and Chris, you may recall what our center looks like with having individual rooms that are relatively large uh, on the ward, it's still pretty hard to do this on the ward with in, inappropriate lighting, not inappropriate, inadequate lighting and um, not adequate suction and so forth. So I, I've been more in the favor if we can do it quickly to start CPR and get them up to the ICU. Again, that would really depend on what the etiology is. If the patient's rapidly bleeding or tamponading, then I'd probably just open the sternum on the board and then move them up to the ICU there afterwards. If it's something else, then you think about trying to get them up to the ICU quickly and then putting them on ECMO, even if we had to, if it's say a VFVF arrest um, post-operatively. Um, so that's a very unhelpful answer. It's, it's saying that it kind of depends, but that's where we're at. We've landed right now in terms of how we're doing it on the ward. JF? Yeah, my question was really, I, I really love the failure to rescue as an outcome. And, uh, right, and, right. and we're just revamping now our sort of M&Ms in terms of, of review. And that's a great opportunity right. for us to also update our database. And what, yeah, yeah. what do you see as sort of the best way to, you know, be as, as, as thorough as we can and, and be as broad as we can in failure to rescue and defining it? And is there right. uh, some guidelines on how you would suggest to do that yeah. going forward? forward. Let me go back to that slide if I can here. Um, now I took out some slides so it's not there but in behind this one if you look at this initial reference from Prager's group from Michigan mm -hmm. this phase of care analysis they have a very simple sort of checklist like algorithm to analyze deaths after surgery. So we're doing the same thing we're implementing this phase of care mortality analysis and helping determine where we think the death may have occurred. And if you, again, if you look at this graph a lot of it comes to preoperative decision making. Um, uh, which is interesting. I hadn't really thought of it that way before, but also in the ICU, the floor and upon discharge. And if you look, use the phase of care mortality analysis, you may pick up those ones, particularly in the ICU and the floor, that would fit the category of failure to rescue. Um, uh, and that's probably, the, for me, I think the way we're gonna go forward and it's probably a reasonable way to start. Okay, because we tend to focus on cause of death, which in reality, you right. know, yeah, it's cardiac or it's respiratory. It really provides no real framework to how to change what you do. No, absolutely. And I think that's where, where what the, the, the Michigan groups really helped us understand is that if you break down the individual components, you can probably try to ascribe the, the most upstream part or a step that may have led to an overall trajectory that led to lack of success in that particular patient. And then therefore hopefully identify targetable solutions rather than saying, well, this person had cardiac arrest and not necessarily learning anything from that to prevent it the next time. Yeah. All right. And I think the, the last uh, comment was from Sue Morris about um, this type of course that was she took in Florida back in 2017. I don't think she's going right. back to Florida right. anytime soon. Do you ever see this coming to Canada? <laughs> Formal course uh, with manual didactic high fidelity sim courses. And with that answer, we'll, we will terminate the session. Go ahead, Rakesh. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much for that question, Susan. So yes, the, the answer is it can come uh, to your center. Again, I, I've got to be careful of my disclosure that you can contact the, the, the society that's uh, providing this education for your teams. Here's I'm a Canadian-only group. Um, I think Yoan LaMarche and I have tried to start this a couple times, but it's been a little challenging just logistically for us to develop a Canadian chapter, if you will. But that will hopefully come. There have been, I think now, over... Um, uh, 90 countries who've been involved uh, with CALS training. Uh, I think 120 centers in the United States alone 
There's, uh, I know us and Hamilton have been formally trained as well with a team. And so as we have more centers in Canada who have trainers who can train participants and train the trainers, I'm hopeful as time goes on that we'll have the ability to have a more comprehensive plan for Canada going forward. Perfect. Well, Rakesh, uh, I think it goes without saying that that was a fantastic session and we were super pleased to have you join us this morning. And uh, if we can ever return the favor, I don't know what we can offer you, but uh, you know, less, less COVID I'm sure there's cases, much. Less COVID cases. I mean, what else can we do really? Uh, <laughs> no, but obviously, uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, check your inbox later for a token of our appreciation. Uh, and uh, thank you for taking the time out early this morning to join us. Very yeah. much. Th thanks very much for the opportunity, guys. Great seeing y'all. Thank you.